Hello, and I can't quite believe that I'm the one saying this, but welcome to another episode of History Hack. Don't worry, your headphones aren't deceiving you. This quite obviously isn't, Alex. This is a special feature uh, and the first of a series of running features called Sharpshooters, focusing specifically on the Napoleonic Wars presented by me, Zach White, and the researcher, podcaster, reenactor, manager of Absley House and resident Bonaparte basher, Marcus Cribb. Marcus, how are you doing? Hello, Zach. How are you? Very well. This is going to be really nice to kind of peel back some of our favourite series, both books and TV, that we've done so much on History Hack with the reunion, but to actually get to the, the history behind it. So I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, explain to people a little bit about how this is going to work, because we want to use the Sharp series as a route into some of the themes to kind of put some of the historical reality on top of the novels, right? Yeah, because I think a lot of people, and pretty much ourselves included, came to the Napoleonic era, the Peninsula War, Waterloo, through either the books or the TV series of Bernard Cornwell's Sharp or starring Sean Bean, whichever way you got there first. And I think a lot of people did it either or both ways. And it certainly gave me a passion for the era and all of the, the flags and colours flying, the drums, the music, the gunpowder, the explosion, um, Wellington riding on Copenhagen, winning the day, and then obviously the John Tams music's inseparable these days. But that's kind of where a lot of people leave it. They've got this vision of a glorious rifles officer running around with his band of near special forces, uh, running all over the place in Spain and saving the Duke's life and mission lots of times. And there's some elements of truth of that. And there's certainly in the, in the books, um, there's a lot more history. And in the TV programme, there's a lot more adventure. But there's some fantastic real life stories behind there, that, some of them which just do not need exaggeration. And we want to kind of get to those and get to the history and say to people why this is a fascinating era with or without Sharp, even though we are fans of um, the series. Yeah, I strongly agree with all of what you've said there. I mean, I remember going to the Rifles Museum in Winchester, which is a great museum. They've actually redone it since since I was last Useful there. Useful artwork collections and everything mm. there, yeah. But while I was there, there was this little um, kind of shooting range thing. And this guy uh, kind of walked up to, because they've got these replica Baker rifles. And this guy walked up to it, picked up the rifle and went, yeah, it's sharp, isn't it? Hooked it down and then walked out of the gallery. And so I, I, I'm with you. It would be nice to kind of use this as a way to put some kind of historical flesh on the bones. Because as you say, some of the historical detail that's in there is actually really impressive. Bernard Cornwell really did his research before he started. Especially um, but this when you all... look at some of the books, he's purposely chosen to, to weave in a, a fictional regiment, the South Essex, which loosely based on the 44th Regiment slash the um, second battalion of detachments, which were very short lived uh, between Porto and uh, Talavera. But they're in there. I'm just wondering, wait, how did you come to it? Did, did you see the films first or the books first? See, I did the books first. I started with Sharp's Trafalgar. Um, we could do a debate at some point about which is your, your favourite favorite. book. Yeah, I know. I, I, for me, it's got a special place in my heart because it was the first one. And then at around the same time, I went to see HMS Victory in Portsmouth, another place that if you've never been, it's well worth going. Because um, you, of course, used to work on Warrior. I used to work on Warrior and then the wider dockyard. So I've done many events on Victory. Never quite qualified as a, a tour guide, but could could roughly show my way from the front to back, left and right, just to wind up the tour guides, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then it, from there, it just kind of snowballed. I think the next one that I picked up was Sharps Waterloo, which is the ultimate place to start, uh, even though it is ironically right at the end. But that's part of the beauty of the books, that you can pick them mm -hmm. up and read them in any order and, and still get a really nice sense of what's going on. And yeah, it just went from there. You know, precocious teenager, I bought uh, Robert Harvey's War of Wars, which was a kind of 800 page tome on everything from 1789 to 1815 um, and kind of bamboozled my my history teacher, who was French uh, for my A-level on kind of my interest of the period. And she was going, yeah, I really don't like Napoleon, um, really don't think he's popular in France. Uh, so you'd, you'd have liked her a lot. Um, and yeah, it's I mean, now I'm doing a, a PhD at Southampton Uni, having done my BA there and my MA there because they have the Wellington Papers. So they're absolutely they sick of me. You. They're never gonna Genuinely, end. I am that proverbial bad penny. Um, but anyway, enough about us. Shall we, shall we jump in? Because today we're not going to look, as we initially said we would, at the guerrilla war 
which is uh, kind of the, the local resistance movement. We're going to focus instead on the start of the war to set the kind of context. But there's a bit of a problem here in that there's actually no sharp in this one. So although it's called well, sharpshooters, we... I mean, this is where Bernard Cornwell, he's gone back and done a lot of what I call the crowbar books, where he's put in some extra episodes, like like Escape, like Havoc. Which actually, I'm a huge fan of these, uh, those books. So they're very well written. And it does cover Porto, which is my current research area. But yeah, we first meet then second lieutenant Richard Sharp uh, in Sharp's Rifles, which is the retreat to um, Corona, which is over the winter of 1808 to 1809, um, the spring of. And that's where we first reach him. And then he arrives back in time for um, Talavera, really, in Sharp's Evil, roughly, give or take, depending on the crowbar books. And um, yeah, we, we do miss the opening stages. But when he's gone back and done the prequels, we last see him um, kind of doing a secret mission in Copenhagen in Sharp's Prey. So Sharp's Rifle actually misses some pretty important events, both the outbreak of the war, of which admittedly the British didn't have too much direct involvement with, but also two major battles, Arelisa and Vermeer. But for me, it's kind of getting back to, by the time we pick up Sharp, the British are actually in a, I'm going to call it a strategic withdrawal, but they're basically in retreat. And there's a lot of fighting already taking place, um, some major battles. And we've kind of missed the, well, how did we get here? Why are these British and their allies, especially the Portuguese, the Spanish, and, you know, embedded British-German regiments there, fighting, dying for the Spain and Portugal? Are we just fighting because we really hate Bonaparte? Is that a bad thing? Is there a lot more to this? You know, why are we fighting really for Portugal? This isn't 1914, 1939. We, why are we not fighting for Belgium? There's a, there's a lot of global politics going on but rivalries subterfuge um and some secrets and spies as well and as you said we, we did say originally we were going to cover the guerrillas but actually in, co- in covering that from 1807 roughly up to 1814 it's a really big um t- topic because it actually covers all of spain well away from the front line all of portugal and there's a lot of characters in there so i think we've decided that we want to kind of give a basis, explain what this war is, and then we can kind of pick out some characters, some of the people that people like Teresa, you know, Sharp's wife, are based on. But I think it deserves its own episode to kind of do it justice. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you say, why are we fighting for Portugal? But perhaps the bigger question, actually, is why do we end up fighting for Spain, who Mm -hmm. a couple of years earlier at Trafalgar, 1805, we're fighting against. Um, So, yeah, it's it's complex. Um, there's There's a lot of politics to kind of get your head around but not All of kind of Spain are our allies and like you said very recently they were our enemies um there's some mm. very interesting characters that quickly pop into the day job you know Miguel de Alava is one of these characters who was at Waterloo with the allies and with Spain fighting against us at Trafalgar and this is not too uncommon um he's one of the few actually did it to both but he certainly would have found people in the Spanish navy who's all of a sudden a year and a half later having to turn against their former friends. So, yeah, that's why I thought we'd dive into this. Yeah, definitely. And weirdly, when you start with the Peninsula War, you don't actually start in Spain or in Portugal, do you? You've got to take it back to, I would say, the Treaty of Tilsit, personally, in 1807, and the the whole continental system. For people who perhaps don't know the period, a little bit of context. In 1805, whilst we are fighting at Trafalgar, In December, Napoleon wins a a crushing victory over the Russians and Austrians at Austerlitz, one of his all-time great victories. Um, That ends something called the War of the Third Coalition. There's then a War of the Fourth Coalition in 1806, where Prussia kind of jumps the gun a little bit, declares war on Napoleon before um, the other members of the coalition are ready. They get absolutely hammered at the twin battles of jena Arstadt. And then in 1807, you have this big kind of peace conference at Tilsit, where Napoleon sits down with the Russian emperor, Alexander, and they go from being enemies to eventually forming an alliance. And part of that is that Russia joins in the continental system. Is that the one where they seal it with a kiss? Well, yes. I mean, there are, Napoleon seems to have thought that he was quite kind of pally with Alexander. He seems to have done a great job at kind of flirting with him or, or something. I'm not entirely sure. He thinks that he comes across as incredibly charming. 
Um, certainly some of the images that come out of them show them incredibly close. Um, so yeah, they, they get pretty pally. Um, there's a nice little incident with some bunnies in there that you're Some quite fond of. Is the, uh, the famous bunny incident, which we've referenced in our Cult of Napoleon episode, if anyone's listening. There's a, one of my favourite Napoleonic stories. Absolutely. And off the back of that, Napoleon has kind of instituted and brought Russia into this system called the Continental System. By this point, Britain is in effect the only enemy left standing. Um, and the idea is that post-Trafalgar, Napoleon didn't have the naval power to secure the channel for long enough to move an army across to defeat Britain on land. Had he managed to land a version of his Grand Armée in Britain, in my opinion, it probably been fair accompli. You know, that would have been the war over. Um, but he can't do that. And because he can't do that, he needs another way to strike at Britain. So the idea is to starve it economically, literally kind of starve it into submission by preventing it from trading. And that will cause economic unrest collapse of the value of the pound, Britain won't be able to keep on fighting, we'll sue for peace. Now, it seems like quite a good idea, but you've got to kind of consider the implications of what he's trying to do, because it's not just shutting off French ports to Britain, it's literally shutting off the entire European continent to British trade. In other words, you're dictating the economic policy of an entire continent, which shows the scale of the guy's power that he even contemplates doing this in 1807. Yeah, I mean, this is where in later conflicts, I'm thinking especially the First World War, the, the Germans tried to do it through submarines, through military might, and they tried to literally starve Britain out of our agriculture and imports. Napoleon can't do this, but he's obviously got the problem that France has got an empire and it's getting pretty big. And the bigger your empire, the bigger basically the back doors entry are from Russia on one side, which they never quite close up all the trade because it is lucrative even though they promised to do so. Then it's looping off into Scandinavia. It's going down into Italy, the Mediterranean. We've got bases all over the place, including Sicily and Malta. Uh, and these boats are coming in and out. Smuggling is very common, uh, especially between uh, France and uh, the south coast of England. You know, there's, there's the old um, poems about four and 20 horsemen gathering through the night and brandy for the vicar and so on. It, it was very common that these imports, exports had been going on. And so there was established links kind of seeping this, what's meant to be like, an, like a bit of a shield around France. And it's already weeping through. But one of the big back doors to France is Spain, the Iberian Peninsula. And that's there. And that's going to be causing him quite a headache. Well, yeah, I mean, this is the problem with the system, isn't it? That it doesn't really work in terms of starving Britain into submission, but it also causes, I mean, it causes some economic damage, of course it does, but it also causes substantial economic damage to France because and, and the wider continent. And that's why it starts to become so unpopular because yeah. it's we're as bad for business at home. Of our empire. I mean, this is the early stages of British colonialism, but we've pretty much, through quite nefarious means, let's be honest, taken over all of India. We still retained um, Canada. This is before the War of 1812. So we've got all of Canada. We've got some substantial Caribbean uh, territories, not to mention places like the Falklands. And it, and it goes on. We've got quite an empire. So it's very difficult for us to lock that off. France doesn't have the naval power. After Trafalgar, or you know, certainly after um, the Nile, uh, Napoleon's never really had the naval power to take us on one on one. Hence, that Trafalgar it was. Uh, an allied fleet against us. It was the Spanish as well, about half the um, enemy fleet. And so they're not going to be able to do it just through enemy might. So it's going to be causing you know, a bit of a double-edged blade to whatever he does. Hence, it's unpopular. Hence, there's people smuggling, um, French people smuggling goods quite openly, quite fragrantly. <laughs> yeah, and, and the other thing is that you have, you have nations who aren't actually beholden to Napoleon. And this is how we get to the Peninsula War, because one of those nations is Portugal. Portugal was not uh, a client state of France by any means. It was an independent monarchy, um, but it was it's nonetheless... Our ally as well. The treaty goes back to the 1400s. And um, I mean, it's based upon the wine trade and anyone who you know, enjoys port, especially, you know, officer's mess and such like, it's literally after Porto, the town, the, the great northern city of, um, of Portugal. And so we love, we love drinking it in Britain. We always have. Literally several hundred years. 
and they like uh, exporting it to us. And it's a really good relationship. We've got very strong relations with um, Portugal, more than many European nations. And that's been like a military alliance as well since not long after that first. So it's not something that the Portuguese are going to want to give up for anybody, let alone somebody who's going chummy with the Spanish. And the Spanish-Portuguese relations have never been good. Well, it's worth bearing in mind that at one point, the Portuguese royal family marries into the British royal family. Catherine of Braganza was wife of Charles II. And for all that Charles II enjoyed sleeping around with his mistresses, he did have a, a deep affection for Catherine. Yes. Uh, whenever she was ill, he, would, he would, was kind of beside himself uh, with, with worry. So they have this very long association with Britain. But as an independent nation, there are two important points here, which, one of which is they're perfectly entitled to decide who they will and won't trade with. Uh, and the other is that they've stayed out of the conflict. There's no real threat. Now, they are, at this point, allowing the Brits to base, uh, I think it's a squadron in Lisbon Harbour, and, and use Lisbon as a point of um, kind of repair and, and restocking to kind of project power um, out into the Atlantic. But that doesn't in itself, in my opinion, justify what follows. Well, you say that. I mean, we've got uh, Gibraltar down the coast. We've got a few naval bases. And you say that you're allowed to determine your own foreign policy and trade. There's a certain guy who's going to disagree with that very strongly in France. I mean, the other point about Portugal is that it was pretty rich pickings, wasn't it? You've got to bear in mind that Portugal was an empire. Brazil was under Portuguese control. That's why to this day, the, the main language of Brazil is, I believe, Portuguese. Really? Um, they have a, a fleet of their own. Um, you've got Spain, who is at this point still Napoleon's ally on the doorstep. Um, not kind of overly keen. Um, to get involved, but still sort of happy to oblige. Um, so in terms of taking the place, it shouldn't be that big an issue. There's certainly no substantial army that's likely to be able to um, cause a huge problem. So it seems like quite an easy move. And it all starts off with an autom ultimatum, right? It does. Uh, Napoleon basically says, not only do I want you to cease trading with Britain, you're going to have to join the continental system hard. You're going to have to declare war on Britain. And as you can imagine, the Portuguese government, which is mostly held in the royal court in Lisbon, I reject this. There's no reason that they want to go back on this ally. It means destroying pretty much the majority of their most lucrative trade with a long-standing ally and a bit of guarantee of protection. You know, as we were saying about um, Brazil, and yeah, they, they speak Portuguese and the uh, Portuguese court ends up being based there. And it's a, it's a big part. You've got this huge amount of sea trade and having the British Royal Navy, you know, the Royal Navy out there helps them so they don't need as big a fleet to have, because it's a relatively small population, uh, Portugal, very rural and agricultural, as it, it still kind of remains today, apart from some of the tourist trade. So they, they want us, they, they help us, we help them. So it's a big ask, not only say cease trade tomorrow, but declare war on them, a war that you can't fight, what you don't want to fight so this does get rejected and i think humbly i think napoleon knew they were going to reject this i think it was an excuse to do what he wants to do which is expand his empire i mean for people who are interested in the dates this is july 1807 that we're talking about this ultimatum goes out and actually it goes further than than you've said marcus because another condition is that they have to arrest all brits within Portugal, which in itself would have been a, an act tantamount to a declaration of war anyway. But this goes at this stage beyond just simple economic policy. This is also foreign policy dictation. Again, talk about breathtaking arrogance of the guy. He's basically telling people who you are and aren't allowed to um, form your alliances with. And if not, an army will be sent in. Is it an excuse? Um, I mean, you could argue that one round in circles all day, couldn't you? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing with Napoleon. How, he's always argued, I see, by, I, I call him cult Napoleon, um, that, well, we declared war on Napoleon. Well, there's normally a catalyst. Yes, we might legally declare war on Napoleon, but what's provoking Britain? Does Britain want a war? There's certain factions, certainly within the Whigs, who, who did. But here is where it's starting to get too far. 
Now, it reaches a stage that actually the threat of the invasion, which is a French force actually moving through Spain, a large substantial force, actually forces um, the Portuguese to first cut off trade, then pretty much in name alone declare war on Britain. And this is what's not normally highlighted. Portugal did declare war on Britain, reluctantly, but they did it. Their actions, well, you said about the, uh, the ships in Lisbon Harbour, in effect, they put them under arrest. Now, it's a really light arrest. And I found in quite a few sources that actually the British came ashore with um, orders from Westminster and Whitehall pretty much one or two days afterwards to start reopening negotiations. So it was one of these kind of proxy wars. I'm always thinking of like Britain against Finland in World War II. That it's a name in war, uh, war in name only, but we don't really want to act upon it. But on paper, Portugal do like live, give in to all the demands that they've changed their foreign policy and their domestic policy and economic policies to this foreign power. We, at the moment, you know, you've got to cover the whole of Spain at a distance. The French are moving into Spain, but Spain is still an independent country as well. Yeah, I mean, initially there's actually some kind of posturing and there are attempts to bribe Napoleon's kind of officials and advisors. This is the Portuguese trying to kind of buy their way out of the situation. Um, I mean, the thing that always strikes me is that um, there's no help forthcoming from Britain at this point. I mean, you've got to bear in mind that in 1806, they launch a, an expedition to Copenhagen when they want to. They managed to divert an expedition to South America, uh, to Spain in 1808. On this one, they didn't move. Um, so it always kind of strikes me that the British perhaps are keen when they think that there's an opportunity. But I think with this one, they kind of thought it was a done deal. Um, the French army eventually reaches Lisbon in what, late November of late 1807? November. Well, when they actually go in, they, they're actually going in with Spanish assistance. The Spanish army are marching pretty much, you know, figuratively alongside them. Um, they're marching in, so it's now a really substantial force. Now, as you pointed out earlier, the, the Portuguese army is actually meant to be quite good, but it's tiny in comparison, especially to the French Grand Army. And they rely upon a lot of ordnance, so militia, um, trained very briefly. So some of them not even with weapons, some of them with like, pikes and spears. And, and then they actually will call a wider uh, kind of call to arms of people who actually just use like farming tools. And they're very motivated. They've repulsed the Spanish in the past with these. Um, but here, I mean, this is a huge, huge threat coming towards them. Only one town she locks its gates, the rest basically capitulate, knowing that if they were going to uh, fight off, they were going to lose. It leads to a really interesting situation when the French army starts to march towards Lisbon and the capital, because the Portuguese uh, court know what's coming. They know that their armies have basically had to surrender. They're not going to get the chance to fight and win. So they just load pretty much everything into boats that they can and escape. And it is within think like half a day they managed to get out of the city kind of just taking everything with them uh, and I mean a huge amount of gold because they've got that gold and silver from the mines in Brazil and they head back to Brazil so they take it there where they are completely safe from French threats the French empire is very big it's mostly continental Europe at this time so they don't have the power to actually go and get all of this loot and it's something that's really downplayed far too much the Bonaparte and I don't just mean Napoleon, I mean the family loot. And Napoleon's marshals. Some of the worst are great um, tactical and strategic minds, like Soult, like Mira. They loot heavily. They're given palaces, but this loot is going back to Paris. I mean, we often blame some British museums uh, in London for having quite a large collection. The Louvre, which was the Musée Napoleon then, it took a lot and lot of loot. And they're wanting to do this, not for, you know, philanthropic um, tendencies. They're not wanting to gather and preserve. They are wanting to show, fill their palaces with some beautiful art, beautiful gold. And they do a lot of it. I'm, I'm very much reminded of that pretty terrible uh, film, The Monuments Men, with George Clooney. Uh, but it's what's happened. This is all being centralised into Paris. And it's one of the aims to actually finance other wars is to get the silver and gold from Lisbon. Yeah, I mean, the whole Lisbon situation ends up being quite fast in the end, doesn't it? Because you've got 
the royal family desperately in effect stuffing the 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 fleet that sails for brazil with the contents of the treasury but the the french march on lisbon ends up descending into a bit of a farce anyway because it's done through forced marches and because it, it, it in effect became a race you know the the portuguese might have agreed to these terms and napoleon invaded regardless but it didn't take a genius to work out how the portuguese royal family might respond so they're desperately trying to get to lisbon to head off this situation in the end juno only has about 1500 men to march into the city with because so many of them have fallen along the way they've literally dropped down on the side of the road exhausted yeah i mean most of them are too weak to hold their muskets i think some units are down to about 10 percent. so the the force that ends up going into lisbon is a farce you've got this kind of farcical situation where they're desperately kind of running through the streets of lisbon trying to um, evacuate as many kind of aristocrats and and the the royal family as possible. It all ends up being a a little bit of a mess. Yeah, and what happens next is really my problem with Bonapartism, the French Empire. Now, Britain is no saint in empire at all, and actually we need to hold our hands up and look at where things go badly. But this has been a really, as it goes, a pretty peaceful invasion. Not a shot's been fired. There's no fighting that's going on. There's no resistance. I think it's pretty fair to allow a country to try to take their jewels and run away, which is what they're doing. And they're going to, you know, carry on with whatever they want in exile. But literally the next day, and I do mean the day after, they, Juno's army starts rounding people up in Lisbon, accusing them of collaboration or resistance. And they're executed. There are executions in the streets or in the prison. And there's no reason I can find for this other than it's an excuse to dominate power with the French Empire. And this is always my personal problem with Bonapartism. But I can't understand why anyone else doesn't have more of a problem with this. People seem to apologise atrocities, massacres, because it's bringing Bonaparte's laws somewhere else. And I don't see that probably Lisbon is a repressive regime. It's probably not doing very good things in slave trade and mining in Brazil. But really... I mean, the French Empire reintroduces slavery. So I don't think there's any motivations here that I can see that would justify executing unarmed civilians the next day. I think the empire's comparison is important because I don't know specifically what your views are on empire, but I do think it's important to hold our hands up to the fact that the British Empire was not the wonderful institution that people have tried to suggest that it was in the past. And there are significant flaws with what the British did that have to be acknowledged and faced up to. And that's it. I think we need to always find balance. I think there's definitely some positives, in, mostly in technology. Um, but then we've done some terrible things, especially in India and Africa. Uh, and this isn't our, our forum for that, but I think it's fair to ha- put our own hands up as two British um, white middle-class males, basically, and put our hands up again. We've got some privilege from that. But so does France, and so did France, and I think it's the excusing of that that is really wrong and put, and kind of going, well, it's justified. It's Bonaparte bringing um, his empire. Well, that's not necessarily a good thing. In fact, I'd argue it's a really bad thing for the Portuguese, who are proudly independent. They've got a very long history. They're doing quite well economically, especially inside for a country that can go through peaks and troughs. I mean, there's some fantastic museums in Lisbon, if anyone gets the chance. Um, about their national heritage and then outside of the capital there's some really good mus- military museums and we'll probably touch on those later on in, in a series but I know we've both been involved with the lines of Torres Vedras and etc like that so there's some great history and heritage there and all of a sudden they're having basically an oppressive regime coming in telling them how to live to change their laws to change their customs and if we don't really like the look of you we will execute you with a musket in the back of the head yeah, I mean, this is the thing. If you're going to quite rightly decry the 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 bad elements of the British Empire, of which you know we are quite frank about, then by the same token, you have to be equally cutting when you're looking at any other empire. And the actions of one don't excuse another, which often seems to me to be kind of the disconnect that we get with um, the 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 ultra pro Bonaparte argument, which is always kind of what we end up trying to deconstruct you know those people yeah. who physically will refuse to acknowledge any failing of the guy whatsoever and there's a lot of them out there it's surprising 
really surprising to I think you and myself who are both active on social media, Facebook, Twitter, etc. Um, that these people out there will vehemently deny there's anything bad. It's blind history. And we were talking very re recently, we're not going to name the podcast, but there's a Napoleon Bonaparte topic podcast out there that we were both listening to. It's quite a few years old. But they just called all the Portuguese bad names. They started to say that they were terrorists. I think that was specifically the Spanish, Marcus, which is actually where we're, we're about to go. Um, but yeah, talking about the the Spanish describing the, the guerrillas as terrorists, which made me spit with anger, um, frankly, but we'll discuss that kind of properly in a measured I way. I think it comes down um, to here, one man's freedom to fight is another man's terrorist. It's an old saying, it's quite true, but the Portuguese at this time have just been invaded, they have not resisted, and they're being killed and massacred for it. There's no justification for that. So that's the situation in Portugal. It's very sad. We're going to get onto that's basically how Britain is going to get involved uh, with this. But let's, as you say, bring it back to Spain, because now Spain's just helped that invasion. So what's happening next with that? I'll tell you, people know if they listen to History Hat that I like a kind of dodgy Game of Thrones comparison. Mm, what happens in true. Spain for me is without kind of spoiling things, this is kind of Napoleon's Daenerys Targaryen at King's Landing moment. If the you know last I mean. series. Yeah. So okay. everything series, that you've... I can see where you're going. Everything up to this point, you can argue one of two ways. Um, and if you... And I understand why people like Napoleon. Genuinely, I do. Um, so there's a lot of what he does up until this point where you can go, okay, you know, there are reasons for this. On balance, good individual. Then you get to the Peninsula War, and I think it's very hard for even the ultra pro Bonapartists to try and find ways to to kind of smooth the rough edges. Oh, but of, they do that. The they oh, do. they do. They do. I mean, it's incredible. Um, as you say, we were listening to that podcast and essentially it was kind of, well, the Spanish brought in the Inquisition, um, which therefore means that they were bad people. Well, let's just bear in mind before we start slinging the dirt that the French executed intellectuals during the terror on the grounds that France had no need of intellectuals. So, you know, <laughs> if you didn't start stop kind of talking about atrocity. Political enemies for quite a long time, taking a personal interest in their daily habits, their daily routines. So, yeah, I think political prisoners are quite high off on Napoleon's list too. So, you know, you have to anyway, be... we digress. <laughs> yeah, we do. Um, you have to be balanced, whatever you, you look at. But essentially, Napoleon goes from having picked up Portugal very easily to thinking about, I believe, just doing a kind of a similar kind of thing in Spain. I think it's a case of Portugal was dead easy and having had to create supply lines across Spain to supply his troops in Portugal, it therefore made it much more feasible to make a, a sudden move on the Spanish throne. I mean, th there's the big question of why Spain. For me, I think it's a case of it being an, an easy target, really. I mean, it's a weaker country militarily, certainly nothing not up to the standard of, of France's army, which is at its absolute peak at, at this point in time. Um, the, the Spanish Navy could have been useful. Um, there's a lot of talk about the fact that the Russians were looking at some kind of descent on Constantinople, that the fleet might have been useful in, in working with the Russians on that. Taking the Spanish fleet would certainly have helped to replace some of the losses at Trafalgar, although obviously the, the French were conducting their own building, um, shipbuilding regime at, at this point in time. There's also talk about whether or not it was a stepping stone to Gibraltar and North Africa. That was certainly the excuse that was used for moving troops in. Um, Britain's concern was that actually Napoleon had an eye on the Spanish colonies. And, and that's why you have this expedition to south america that ends up being planned in in 1808 but yeah it's it's an odd one what's your take on it there's a lot of motivations and i think it comes down to me to expansionism he's taking over a lot in the east and he's not actually gone anywhere and he's kind of got to join the dots if he's going to do complete control of portugal which is what he's basically done by an army of occupation he then doesn't want an ally between him and another part of his empire. He's then going to have quite a porous exit. You know, can Spain trade? Can Spain smuggle with Britain? Is going to lead to some sort of uneasy areas. It's a huge country. 
it does have potential riches there as well. He's got an uneasy relationship with the Bourbon throne there, which is very complicated uh, because of the history between the thrones of France and Spain. And yeah, he's at his zenith, you know, 1808, roughly we're talking now. He's, he's at his peak, the Grand Army that yes, Napoleon usually uses conscripts, but he's got volunteers, they've got a lot of experience, they've won some fantastic victories. And even myself, and I, you know, adamantly bash Bonaparte as the joke goes, I've got to admit his army and him have done some great you know, victories and they're very powerful. The Spanish army is pretty big, but they're just not at that same level. And they actually pull out some quite surprising uh, victories at the back, but at the same time, you sometimes see them with overwhelming numbers being beaten by French columns. So they are beatable. They're also pretty unsuspecting. They've opened their arms to say, well, let's go into Portugal together. So they've been infiltrated. The French army's in pretty good areas, both throughout the country and around the capital. So they're in a very good position. And I think it's one of those moments you've got this big juicy apple right in front of Bonaparte and he just can't resist taking that bite. He is an opportunist. Whatever you say, positive or negative, I think it's often a positive for him. He's an opportunist, somebody who wants power. I think too much, he's driven by ego, but it's there, it's there for the taking. And it's not on paper going to be very difficult. Yeah, I agree that the whole on paper, it's not difficult thing is definitely a factor. I mean, you've got to bear in mind the continuity between the two. So in November, very late November, Juno's marching into Lisbon. In February, uh, Napoleon sends one of his best cavalry commanders, Murat, down to take personal command of the troop, the French troops in Spain. And there are 60,000 in Spain by this point. So we're not talking an insignificant number already by February. I mean, that is a huge force. To, to put it into context, the British army today, we're recording this at the beginning of 2021, is just under 80,000 regulars. So and it's just one branch of your army being in Spain, 60,000, is a huge force. Well, the British didn't have 60,000 men from its own army in Spain until 1812, yeah. for kind of context. So, I mean, it's, it's a huge force. In fact, a lot of those are... 60,000 British at Waterloo. We've got so many allies. It is a really substantial um, army, especially when you're given the size of the populations at the time. This population of Europe is about a third of what it is now. You've also got to bear in mind the political instability or, or this moment of instability that creates kind of uh, the, the ultimate opportunity, I think, for Napoleon. Because in March, there's a revolt of the palace guards, which forced the king, the Spanish king, Charles IV, to abdicate in favour of his generally considered to be more popular son, Ferdinand VII. And for me, I think this is the moment where Napoleon missed an incredibly smart play because he could have, in effect, endorsed Ferdinand in such a way as to consolidate his kind of puppet master control to a degree over Ferdinand. But he doesn't do that. He go he goes all in. He goes for broke. Um, and instead, he summons both uh, Charles and Ferdinand, because there is obviously animosity between the two, um, to Bayonne, under the pretense of kind of sorting this out. You know, he's going to be the grand yeah, arbitrator. it's going to be a mediation. This is not too uncommon that a foreign mediator might come in and say, look, let's sit down, let's have a conversation, and let's get you to sort it out. And in return, I'm going to want a bit more influence, which is definitely what he probably needs, even if he's going to be in Portugal. He's going to need the influence in Spain. However, these got some pretty nefarious motives now. Well, you've got to think of it from the Spanish perspective as well. This is the guy who is their ally. And so he's offering himself up as an arbitrator in a moment of kind of constitutional upheaval. So you're perhaps, well, I, I don't know how much they trusted Napoleon at this point, because there is talk about um, there being reluctance for, I believe it's Ferdinand, to actually go to um, Bayonne, which is where they're summoned to. But Ferdinand's whatever the truth is, it... and Charles is going, well, I've pretty much been overthrown, so I can't lose too much more. Uh, so let's go. And, you know, they're stepping off friendly territory into what's meant to be allied. Uh, but, you know, Bayonne's not too far over the border. Uh, so it seems like a sensible move, but it doesn't turn out that way for them. 
No, I mean, what for people who aren't familiar with the story, what effectively happens is that they are both forced to relinquish all claim to the throne. It is, in effect, a coup. So on the 5th of May, they both agree that from this moment on, they will not be the, the king of Spain, and they relinquish the claims of their um, their successors to the throne as well. Yeah, so he's gone in. He's taken two potential claimants, both the sitting king and his his father, and effectively puts a, a proverbial gun to the back of their head and forces them to abdicate. And this is like every bad um, British comedy action film. I'm thinking Johnny English, where they hold a gun to the corgi and they force the queen to abdicate. That's what's going on here. That he's saying, actually, there's not a lot you can do about it. You're in France. There's both the Pyrenees and an army between you and your country. And I've got it now. I've got an army inside uh, Spain, and I've got an army surrounding you. And physically, there's not a lot they can do about it. Um, they are they are stuck. So there's not many other terms of it, but it's pretty underhand coup he's just gone and done. I mean, I have heard people suggest that this is all a revenge for a plan that was put forward by the, uh, in effect, Prime Minister of Spain, Manuel Godoy, to invade France. This plan was kind of created in 1806, and the the pro Bonaparte camp kind of suggests that Spain was a duplicitous ally, and that Napoleon is just kind of securing his southern border. But I've got a little quote here. Mm. Um, this is these are Napoleon's own words that kind of sum it up for me. He says, "Spain must be French. It is for France that I have conquered Spain. It is with her blood, her arms, her gold. I am French in all my affections." I do not do anything except for love of France. I dethroned the Bourbons for no other reason than it was in the interest of France to assure my dynasty. I had nothing else in view except French strength and glory. I have the rights of conquest. Call whoever governs Spain king, viceroy or governor general. Spain must be French. For I mean, me, there's not much you can say to that. That is, I mean, you, you're quoting that from Charles Esdale's brilliant work on the Prince of the War. And that's Napoleon's own words. And there's a lot given to are they Bourbons or not, but I don't think that matters too much. Napoleon sees a throne and basically wants it. Uh, You say the analogy of Game of Thrones. He's taking them, he's gathering, and he's winning. See, if you want another dodgy Game of Thrones analogy, for me, blaming the Spanish for um, Napoleon's takeover is a bit like watching what happens to the Starks at the Red Wedding and saying, yeah, but it's it's those Northerners with their dodgy customs worshipping their trees. They kind of deserved it. It's, I think it's, if the it's on a path. Was the, like the, the pulling out the crossbows, that would be like very close. Kind of going, we've got you. Trousers pretty much down. What are you going to do about it? That, I think that's that's pretty close. Yeah. Let, let's move away from Game of Thrones analogies. Game of Thrones, and, and... Game of Thrones Napoleon is the box set we're bringing to you next year. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, who's who's paying for it again? <laughs> HBO. And I... it goes on. And funnily enough, the Spanish people are not best pleased by this. They are, I mean, we're saying about the Portuguese and their heritage, the Spanish, a, a, a fiery race. They've got some fantastic history and heritage. But there's another couple of factors thrown in. And the first one, just quickly to mention, is religion. So you mentioned the Inquisition. That's come and gone quite a lot over uh, times, but the power of the church has always been very paramount in Spain. You know, it's, it's a fiercely Catholic country. They have their, um, their saints and their traditions and their feast days very high up their calendar, which is something that we just don't have in, in Britain for many of our listeners. And I just want to um, kind of stress the importance of that. Whereas the French Revolution, which in name at least Napoleon is representing, he removes the Catholic Church directly from France. And there's, there's actually a point that Napoleon's actually been excommunicated from the Catholic Church. And this is where the term of like Antichrist is coming in, mostly in very successful British propaganda. And it's something we do very well as propaganda. But there's a genuine fear of the Spanish people who are religious to a level of superstitious level are worried that their church, which is very important to them, and I think that's that's their personal beliefs, is important. 
So that's that they're worried about the French influence. They're worried that they're going to be forced to maybe um, give up uh, many of their traditions and their rights and their beliefs, along with literally losing their power to a foreign uh, to a foreign uh, invader. And Napoleon's actually really good ideas. He offers the throne of France to his brother, not Joseph, but Jerome, who turns it down, which is quite a surprise move because uh, it's, a, it's a big country, and then offers it to his elder brother, Joseph, who is, I, I can't even remember who described him. I think it's Esdale, but I could be wrong. Described um, in as the most feckless of all his, uh, the Bonaparte feckless family. And then, that sounds pretty much like Charles Esdale, yeah. And, you know, I'm, I've used these books to help form my opinion, and uh, yeah, I'm, I strongly agree with it. The, the Bonaparte family, apart from Napoleon, are pretty useless out for themselves, out for the looting. Um, I think, you know, Pauline Bonaparte deserves her own episode. She's brilliant, but she's in it for herself and to get married and then just to have loads of affairs and in a beautiful palace. And that's the life she wants to live. Okay. But Joseph Bonaparte, he's not a great administrator. He's a really, really bad tactician. And he's now going to have to be governing a huge, powerful and important country in his brother's name. And this is not going to go down very well. Well, you say that, but I mean, he hadn't had too, run a, too bad a run as King of Naples. So I, I agree, he, you know, Joseph wasn't Napoleon's first choice for Spain. But I kind of think that Spain was a bit of a poison chalice anyway, because whoever you gave it to, they were always going to be subservient to Napoleon anyway. And by the time Joseph arrives, things were already kind of, you know, the proverbials hit the fan. Uh, by that point, because what's really interesting in terms of this timeline is that there's a famous uprising called the Dos de Mayo uprising, literally the, the 2nd of May uprising, which, as the name suggests, took place on the 2nd of May, i.e. three days before Ferdinand even signs on the dotted line, relinquishing well, his claim to the throne. That actually, we've missed the little stage there. And, well, it's actually unfair on Napoleon because he's taken Ferdinand and Charles into, into France. But he's also now, or at least there are rumours, that he's requesting that the younger members of the Spanish royal family, including the princesses, leave. And this is one of the big catechists, that the king and kind of king regent had left peacefully for negotiations. And now the princesses and, and the children are being requested. And this is the stage it kind of becomes beyond the pale. Now, obviously, in a country... I was going to say without social media, but I'm not sure social media is always a power for, news, uh, for good in the news. And, uh, you know, we live in a world where anyone can put an article online and you can read it. But it, there's pamphleteers, there's orators, there's speakers in the streets. Things are being said. Actually, one of the most powerful news um, methods in the century is through the church. It's um, going through and it turns to Spanish people, not unsurprisingly, you know, against the French very quickly. Yeah, I mean, it all gets quite out of hand. As you say, the discontent's been been brewing really since March, um, particularly with France kind of refusing to recognise Ferdinand as, as rightful king. So the, there are concerns that the writing may be on the wall. And then, as you say, it all gets out of hand with relation to this move of the royal family. And they end up attacking Murat's aide-de-camp. Um, Murat in response, he, you know, he's only a few hundred metres away in his own headquarters, orders for the streets to be cleared by the Imperial Guard, which are, which are, you know, the elite crack troops of the French army. It's like sending in the SAS to clear the streets. Um, ten Spanish end up being killed, more are wounded. Um, and the, the Spanish give as good as they get, in complete fairness. Um, they respond by killing the fairly few French soldiers that they can find. And it escalates from there. The rebels are quickly crushed. By the end of it, 200 Spaniards are dead, another 200 wounded, 300 of prisoners arrested in the course of putting down the, the uprising to a, a French casualty rate of, of 31 dead and 114. But here's where it gets really nasty, because Murat orders a really brutal reprisal. He issues this population, sorry, this proclamation saying, and I'm quoting here, the population of Madrid led astray has given itself to revolt and murder. French blood has flowed. It demands vengeance. All those arrested in the uprising, arms in hand, will be shot. 
So this is what kind of one of those ultimate brutal reprisals and it's you know just the worst possible pr play in perhaps the entirety of the napoleonic wars yeah i mean it's some of the most evocative paintings there's uh during that time the spanish peasantry literally with the weapons they've got on them like normal everyday knives you know it's a tool um attack some of the mamelukes which are part of the uh the royal guard the imperial guard traditionally recruited from areas of the Ottoman Empire and Egypt and that kind of, so it starts to get a bit diluted. Uh, and they've got these flamboyant uniforms that really marks them out. And they are thought, was, as you said, some of the elites. And this is encapsulated in a beautiful painting by Goya, um, Francesco Goya. It's one of the biggest uh, names in Spanish art of the era. And it's encapsulated there. And we'll, we'll make sure we've definitely got it on our Twitter, etc. Uh, it's one of my favourites. Um, but also during this, the Spanish don't take this lying down. And there's um, some quite junior Spanish army officers who are in the city at the time, actually possibly uh, discussing uh, re- uh, guerrilla warfare, what they know is coming. And they're kind of caught off guard and they decide with patriotic fear that, to kind of go in and help out. And they open up one of the armories. They start distributing weapons to the, the Spanish and the, the Spanish off-duty soldiers. And they, they form a line of defence and defend this armory and they are they are massacred and these men are now national heroes and they they thought it's thought of as the first stage in a war of independence against a foreign oppressive power well that's what the spanish call it they call it la guerra de la independencia my spanish pronunciation is horrific but it's literally the war of independence and you've just hit on a really nice little note there la guerra guerra is war and then so Little War uh, comes in, and that's where we get guerrillas from. Guerrilla warfare yeah. comes basically from Spain. Now, there's, there's been insurgency in Star Warfare for actually centuries earlier, but this is where we're going to get onto a whole other episode where it really starts to take on its own model, its own specialism. And there's actually insurgencies, counterinsurgencies, the French form of units to fight against them. Hence, it's a very interesting topic. But it's also a very important part of uh, Spanish national identity. Yeah, I mean, we should say that not everyone who was a guerrilla, for people who aren't familiar, guerrilla, which is the, I believe the Spanish pronunciation, is literally, as you just said, stands for little war. So when we talk about guerrilla warfare or guerrillas, we're not talking about some kind of oversized ape or something. You know, we're, we're talking about a specific style of warfare. Uh, this isn't some kind of Tarzan moment as Marcus beats his chest. Um, but not everybody who was a guerrilla, or at least who was involved in reprisals against the French, was necessarily motivated by national fervor. And this is something that we'll look at properly when we do our episode. But it is worth saying at this stage that some of them were just bandits who were keen to kick people's heads in. But there is nonetheless a kernel of this, which is people deliberately employing, in effect, hit and run tactics, using the train to their advantage to make life incredibly hard for the French. But that's something that is to come further down the line yeah. in terms of our series it, and the war. And we're going to use some great examples of some amazing characters out there. And Bernard Cornwell, Sharp, our link here, he picks up on the fact that most of these people are kind of self-promoted on the success and they're given some fantastic names. Hence Teresa, they call her the needle. Don't ask why. And all these characters that come in. But I'm going to play the point of balance here, which is really unusual for me. Uh, Zach's looking quite surprised. Then there is another thing. There's guerrillas and there's ampressasados. Now, these are typically men, but actually uh, women play a large part in court politics because they can get people together for gatherings. Um, so definitely, though they're not as well written about, uh, the women in the, what I'm going to call the Napoleonic era, I know they do a lot in uh, Regency Britain, actually have a huge part to play in internal politics because they can p- put together all the gatherings. That's something they like to do and they're very good at. So ampressasados are people who support France and or we call them collaborators. I think we could go as far as to say. It depends on their level. They've got a lot of different levels to it. And it's very interesting because they, they are welcoming the French to a certain degree, whether that is going to be to maybe slightly remove the power of the church. Maybe it's to slightly remove the power of the aristocracy. Maybe to, to improve these ideas of uh, liberalism. Or to be slightly sceptical back in return, maybe it's for their own gain and power. Because as soon as you remove somebody, it means that there's an opportunity to step up somewhere else. 
So there are Ancestor Stardos. In fact, my little sharp thing to this is uh, Sharp's Rifles in the episode, especially the first episode, you see two brothers, one fighting as a guerrilla leader, and one fighting with the French army. And they have a little duel at the end of Sharp's Rifles. So it's a nice little link uh, there, just to prove that not everybody was fighting against the French, though many brave individuals literally took off whatever they could find in the streets in, on the Dos de Mayo. Yeah, um, let, let's take it back to immediately after the Dost Mayo, because uh, uh, it, it's a nice little bridge there. Um, for me, what's really striking about this is kind of the ripple effect, because you've got the, the Dost Mayo uprising, on, as it suggests, the 2nd of May. On the 5th of May, you've got Ferdinand signing on the dotted line. What that therefore means is that as you've got news going out from Madrid about... Um, the the uprising there at the same time you've got news coming in from france that the king has renounced his claim to the throne and for me i think that's why this turns into an absolute powder keg of a situation if perhaps you had one or the other or even if you had a degree of separation between the two that might have been one thing but the two together in such quick succession really does kind of explode the situation even then though i i think the situation is probably helped quite a lot by the fact that although the French have about 90,000 troops in Spain by this point, they don't occupy the entire country. Most of those troops are garrisoning the big Spanish fortresses in the north, um, with the exception of those that are around Madrid. And so that then gives the Spanish army the opportunity to mobilise. And even then, I think the big kind of catalyst for change here is the Battle of Balen, which happens uh, in, in the summer which is a total game changer. The reason it's a total game changer is that you have a Spanish army defeating and forcing a French army to surrender. Um, I spoke to a, a Spanish historian over the summer who described Balin as being like a dream. It's on that kind of level of unexpectedness. For kind of a little bit of context, effectively what happens is the French have a flying column that's being sent out to pacify the interior of Spain under a guy called Dupont. And it ends up being caught, strung out, um, partly because it's carrying its wounded and partly because it's carrying, ironically, its loot. And so you have this split French force kind of arriving, trying to counter um, this Spanish threat. And the counterattacks are launched kind of in a piecemeal way and they get absolutely nowhere. In the end, the French take uh, about 2000 casualties and Dupont realises that the game is up um, and off the back of that, he negotiates rather than kind of fighting to the death. He does a sensible thing, saves the lives of his men and agrees to surrender 17,000 men who are, in theory, supposed to be repatriated. But, in uh, you know, we're trying to be fair here uh, and do a kind of warts and all coverage of this. The Spanish didn't honour that. They transported them to the island of Carbera, uh, where many of them died from salvation. In terms of the, the wider conflict, though, it kind of sends shockwaves because the French are meant to be the best army going and what That's you have suddenly, here suddenly defeating somebody who's basically never been defeated before makes them no longer look vulnerable so it makes no longer makes them look invulnerable they suddenly have a weakness and like we've said earlier the spanish army very well motivated not very well equipped not very well trained but they come through and equally this is ends up being a, a strategic game changer for the Spanish, because the French kind of see this and conduct a strategic withdrawal. So they withdraw everything they've got back behind the River Ebro, which is a river in northern Spain. Um, and that, therefore, means that you've got an interior of a country which is able to rise up and attempt to form some kind of resistance. Well, this is where Britain comes back in again. Um, so the Spanish is suddenly fought themselves to a very good position. They've got a scattered army it's around Spain, and the Portuguese are sending official things basically going, you know we never actually meant to go to war with you. That, that was like day, it was like day one, we're opening negotiations back with Britain. And we've got this very, very long alliance going. So, as we said earlier, we've had actually had an expedition to South America, Buenos Aires, a very um, ill-fated British expedition. And there's another one intended to uh, Central America. And so it's a force that's starting to be assembled. They haven't quite decided who was going to lead it, and there's lots of different opportunities. 
At this stage, Wellington, as he then is after Wellesley, stuck his hand up in Britain, and he actually said, give me anything. I quite like the idea of um, commanding this one over to America, um, but his brother, uh, Richard Wellesley, Earl of Mornington, said, actually, we could send him back to India as commander-in-chief, which would be a huge promotion. Now, they decide to change this uh, command from South America to Portugal. And this is where, on in June 1808, uh, he comes in. And it's just a really nice couple of little letters. Uh, there's a nice letter from uh, His Royal Highness, the Commander-in-Chief, to uh, Sir Arthur Wellesley, KB, Horse Guards, 14th of June, 1808. Letter begins, Sir, His Majesty, having been graciously pleased to appoint you to the command of a detachment of his army, to be employed upon a particular service. I have to desire that it will be pleased to take the earliest opportunity to assume command of his force and carry into effect such instructions as you received from His Majesty's ministers. It then goes on to list the um, battalions, uh, some really interesting ones, people that you uh, hopefully everyone would recognize, including the 95th Rifles, the 60th Rifles, who appear in Sharp, um, and that most of them actually in Cork at the time assembly. Very soon afterwards, um, you can tell how. Uh, how pleased Wellesley uh, is, because on the 23rd of June, uh, just next week, he writes from Dublin, uh, where he's based uh, to start to lead his expedition. He writes to his good friend, uh, Roland Hill, known as Daddy Hill. In uh, Sharp's Eagle, you might remember that he commands one of the flanks. And uh, he writes, my dear Hill, I rejoice extremely at the prospects I have before me of serving with you again. And I hope that we should do more than what we had on the last occasion we were together. I propose to leave Cork tomorrow and you shall receive my instructions from London. And then he goes on to uh, kind of micromanage the uh, campaign. Now, Hill and Wellington are a really nice kind of um, power duo. Definitely a Batman and Robin kind of situation. They are excellent together. But um, yeah, you can tell that Wellington's quite excited. And he's going to get his teeth into an ex basically a British expeditionary force. It's quite small. It's very well formed. It's got some very good units. Um, just to put it into context, these are mostly first battalions. Most regiments at the time are first and second battalions. And the second tend, definitely not always, but tend to be based more in Britain and Ireland to uh, replenish, retrain, and send out replacements. So when you see the second battalions, often it means that the first battalion has been basically decimated in battle. And so they, they're sending out the second. But you see um, pretty good units, including, like I said, the, the 50th, 60th, the Royal American Rifles, um, which we see uh, in Sharp's company, uh, in Sharp's enemy and company, and go on. But then we also see the, the 95th, the famous Sharps uh, unit coming in. And so right from the beginning, you've got Sharps regiment there. And this is June 1808, heading out um, to Portugal to start to try to arguably do some good. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that the Spanish initially don't actually want an army. And even when Wellington, Wellesley as he was back then, turns up on the northeastern, northeastern coast of Spain, um, they go, no, we don't want you here. Go away. We don't need you. And that's why he ends up deploying to Portugal. But the French are also changing their situation. You know, Napoleon comes down in person to take command because he realises that, you know, he needs to do something to solve this mess. And the best thing he can do is go down and personally command. Um, equally, Murat gets switched out. Um, he ends up marry marrying Caroline Bonaparte. I believe he then becomes, ironically, king of naples i.e he gets he joseph's job uh, joseph's brought in as king uh, but it's what i love about this is the public reaction in britain to the news of the uprising because there is just this absolute explosion of interest and you see so many caricatures coming out uh, caricatures are kind of they're not a perfect barometer of public interest but effectively when you haven't got opinion polls there they're a nice indicator of what people are enjoying to laugh at because you know these things are shared around they are physically bought so if you don't have a an engaging caricature it doesn't sell uh, and we have more caricatures for 1808 than we do for the next three years of the war combined so the public goes absolutely mental for this kind of um, getting caught yeah, up in that's not surprising with british people we also have to see the opportunity help fight the underdog plucky little portugal and oh the breath the press is going to go mad and we see this so often i mean today private eye magazine you know the Matt comic in the telegraph these things are really popular um for satire and back it's not there, portugal that they focus on though they focus on spain they get kind of caught up in this romanticized notion of uh, there's one there's a particularly great one that people will find very easily 
on Google, uh, Spanish patriots attacking the French banditi, loyal mm-hmm. Britons lending a lift. Um, you might know it. It's got this kind of sturdy looking British grenadier in the foreground, simultaneously killing two men at the same time. Uh, it's very kind of pro-British, uh, but it, it fits perfectly with the whole kind of propaganda thing that's been going on at this time of Napoleon, the usurper. Here he is usurping again. Um, but yeah, the, the Spanish, they just want money. Ironically, they want money and they want muskets. They don't particularly want an army, but it's ready to go because the British have been looking at the situation and they've come up with their own thinking, which is that the Spanish colonies represent some really rich pickings. And this is something that Britain does a lot. It takes an opportunity when Napoleon takes over a country to go, ah, Napoleon will occupy those colonies and use them for his own. We need to address that. Therefore, we'll occupy them and attend to them ourselves. And the reason that the British Empire expands so rapidly off the back of the Napoleonic Wars is because those colonies never end up getting handed back in 1815. Um, But yeah, so the plan is to send this expedition to South America and then ultimately Central America. Um, But that's that's not how it plays out. Wellington ends up being sent to to the Iberian Peninsula and and is given the discretion, where do you want to land? Um, And decides eventually on, on Portugal. Yeah, and this will lead us to, which is going to be its own thing, but it leads us to the Battle of Elisa, which is very quickly followed by Romero. Now, Bernard Cornwall never actually writes his shots at those battles. I think they're fantastic. Elisa especially, because Wellington goes in. It's not a big scale battle, but he goes on the attack, literally fighting up some cliff tops. Uh, it's one I really like, the, the riflemen of the, the 60th and the 95th, basically like charging up this hill over walls, and in they go. And Romero is very much more of a classic British on, on a hill, Two ranks deep, skirmishes out, French marching up in column, and every time they're fought away. And this is kind of the first time that we see this. These, I, I wrote an article about it called "They Came Along in the Same Old Style for the First Time," which tried to be a bit ironic. And it's it's a classic um, battle, but we see both sides of Wellesley Wellington very early on, uh, where he goes on the attack, both uh, literally and during the campaign strategically. And it's something that I'm always defending. People say, "Oh, well, he just..." On the reverse slope, waiting for the French to come on. No. Rubbish. He, he's on the attack. Rubbish, he calls. Um, he's he's on the attack. He has to be. He's basically gone into uh, an enemy country. You know, Portugal might be our ally, but it's under foreign occupation. He's basically going to have to be behind enemy lines. and Off he goes into the hills, forging his own logistic bases and depots. And something he does very well um, is start building alliances. And it, he finds it's a lot easier to work with the Portuguese then the Spanish, but that's a whole other thing. But that's um, certainly the situation in summary. Yeah, as you say, the whole Wellington and, and how he operates is it's kind of three episodes in itself, but we'll we'll get there. Um, so yeah. next time we're <laughs> going to talk about the, the guerrillas. So we'll give you what we effectively promised to give you. Um, we'll talk about the guerrilla, the little war, um, the reality of who these people were, the kind of the the multitude of motivations that they had and also we'll start to bring in properly the kind of the sharp influence talking about some of the individuals who crop up over the course of it and the the elements of their character which were actually demonstrated by some real life individuals out in Spain during the course of this conflict. Yeah there's definitely some real life characters that come to mind that influence people like especially I can think of um some real life riflemen that influence people like Hagman and, and, and Harris is literally a uh, the character that's slightly evolved. And there's people very similar to Hogan uh, and they're fictionalized. And so next time we're going to basically feature on the, the gorillas, which we see straight from the beginning with uh, Teresa. But there's a lot more in the books, El Castrado uh, and many others. And their real life counterparts, you know, they might be given a, a fictional name, but Bernard Cornwall does a very good job of them and they're really important to the war but to the the Spanish identity as well and they have a huge influence and they're often kind of underplayed as like a a sidekick and there's a whole other element going on so I'm looking forward to diving into that and so what we're going to do is Alex and Alina um, massive thanks to them by the way Uh, ladies thank you for making us part of History Hack and normally Zach and I are on the down the pubs being very sarcastic but They've given us the reins to have our own uh, monthly. We're going to do it along. I think with... that's completely mental. I don't know what they're doing, trusting us with their podcast for for an episode a month. But hey, <laughs> thanks, girls. Usurpers. No, um, we're we're really really grateful. Uh, I like I'm 
pleased that they've got the faith in us. So uh, we're going to do a monthly uh, podcast, Sharpshooters, along with uh, Matt Bones doing hedge hopping. Matt Bones, uh, fantastically knowledgeable and enthusiastic about um, planes, especially World War II, but I think he's got quite a wide remit. And so he's doing hedge hopping and he's going to have a guest on each week. And Alina is going to be doing a monthly pole position. If you don't know, Alina loves Poland and Polish history. So that's going to be great. So we're going to be um, one of these monthly regulars, hopefully, on History Hack. So thanks very much for listening. We'll be a monthly uh, recording to your ears. Uh, if you want to support History Hack, we, uh, Alina and Alex, are on Patreon. So you support them and it will help them kind of keep going, advertising, marketing, putting some of this together for you every month. So log on, there'll be the link after this um, for Patreon paid and you can pledge. And actually we've worked with them so there can be some goodies. And there's, if you love uh, Steve Smith design, he's given us a brilliant design, but you can get that on mugs, hoodies and t-shirts. So you can support them coming forwards. Uh, otherwise, listen out for the next episodes with head shopping, pole position and down the pub regulars.